What's up guys, Sagi here and welcome to another Tech Gear Talk. Today I wanna to cover a super important question that I get all the time. And the question is, I'm getting such and such camera, it doesn't matter what it is, what's the first lens I should buy? There are a lot of different lenses available, even if you're just looking at one brand, let alone third party options. So today I'm gonna to teach you a little bit about lenses and walk you through the fundamentals of selecting the right first lens. And you'll see that my advice is gonna be a little different than what a lot of other people recommend. And I'm curious to know what you think at the end of this video. If you already pulled the trigger and ordered a new camera, then congratulations. If not, I would suggest that you check out the lens selection that's available for the brand and the model that you're considering before buying. I don't expect a beginner to need 10 lenses, but I think that you should look at what's available. And also, it's really important that you look at the cost of the lenses. A lot of times people ask something like, I wanna shoot weddings and this is my budget, should I get camera A or camera B? And what I need to know in order to really help is, is this your budget just for the body or for the body and the lenses, not to mention all the other accessories that you need. Most cameras, both DSLR and mirrorless, and particularly entry-level models, are sold in kits meaning that the manufacturer is pairing the body with an entry-level zoom lens. I shoot a lot with Canon, so I'll be using some of my cameras to show you examples, but this is true across brands. So something like the Canon SL2 or 200D, depending on where you're from, is often sold with the 18 to 55 STMIS. And something like the M50 is sold with the 15 to 45 millimeter lens. If we wanted to look at another manufacturer, like for example, Nikon, the D3500 or the 5600 are also offered with an 18 to 55 VR lens. And you'll find similar 35 millimeter equivalent lenses from Sony, Panasonic, Olympus, Fuji, wherever you look. Now the number that you see on the lens followed by MM describes the focal length range of the lens with smaller numbers corresponding to the wide field of view and larger numbers corresponding to zoom. A shorter focal length like 18 millimeters is gonna be very wide, whereas a longer focal length like 200 is going to narrow your field of view and capture a lot less of the scene. The longer focal length also fills more of the frame with the subject and therefore effectively appears to bring the subject closer to the camera. So here's the same subject on the same camera at 10 feet distance with an 18 millimeter lens. And here it is again, we haven't moved the camera or the subject, but we're now using a 55 millimeter lens. And as a final example, here's the same subject at the same distance, same camera, but using a 200 millimeter lens. So a zoom lens like an 18 to 55 millimeters means that the lens can go from 18 millimeters at the widest to 55 millimeters at the most zoomed setting. Some lenses called prime lenses like this 50 millimeter Zeiss F2 will only have one number, which means they offer a fixed focal length rather than a range. So a zoom lens offers a range like 18 to 55, 24 to 70, 70 to 200, and the prime lens is a fixed focal length like 50 millimeters, 85 millimeters, 100 millimeters. By the way, because there are so many lens options and brands and, and different subjects and purposes, I created a lens buying guide and I'll leave a link to it in the description so you can go download it and take a look at it at your own pace. It's free of course and it has more samples and brand specific recommendations. And I'm also able to update it when new lenses come out, which is something I can't do in this video. All right, moving on, something that often trips people up is trying to compare lenses between different sensor sizes and specifically understanding how the angle of view is impacted by the size of the sensor. In order to be able to compare and understand how a certain lens or focal length is going to look on one sensor size versus another, we need some kind of standard. And the industry agreed upon standard is to use 35 millimeter equivalent or full frame equivalent. If you're wondering why that is, it has to do with the days where most people shot on 35 millimeter film. This meant that for most camera, I'm not talking about medium and large format, we're using the same size recording medium. So this created a situation where people very quickly came to know what a 50 millimeter field of view looked like, or what an 85 millimeter field of view looked like, a 24, and so on. It was always the same across different cameras because they were all using the same film size. And this is essentially still the case if we're talking about full frame sensor cameras. So something like the 5D Mark III or the Sony a7 III, if you put a 50 millimeter prime on it, 
would have essentially the same field of view as a 35 millimeter film camera with a 50 millimeter lens. But now with DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, we have more sensor sizes to choose from. And for today's discussion, I'll include APS-C and Micro Four Thirds because they are two of the most popular formats. Most APS-C sensors have a 1.5X crop factor, except for Canon, where it's 1.6, but to keep the math simple, we're gonna use 1.5. Micro Four Third sensors like Panasonic and Olympus have a 2X crop factor. This means that when we take a 50 millimeter lens and put it on an APS-C sensor camera, it will give us a 50 times 1.5 or 75 millimeter equivalent field of view, meaning that it would be more zoomed in than a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame sensor camera. If we took a 50 millimeter lens and put it on a micro four third sensor camera, it would give us a 50 times two or 100 millimeter angle of view, which would be the same as putting a 100 millimeter lens on a full frame sensor camera. And this is why when you look at Micro Four Thirds lenses, you'll see that they come in much lower focal lengths than lenses designed for APS-C and full frame sensor cameras. And this is mostly important when you're comparing lenses before you select a body. If you're looking at a lens like the Olympus 25 mm f1.8, which costs around 250 bucks, and you compare it to the Nikon 24 mm f1.8, which costs around 750 bucks, you might think that the Nikon lenses are three times the price. But when you consider that the Olympus lens is being used with a Micro Four Thirds sensor, and there's a 2X crop factor, that means that the Olympus lens is really a 55 millimeter equivalent F1.8. And by comparison, the Nikon 50 millimeter F1.8 is around 215 bucks, which is actually cheaper. We haven't really discussed the aperture much, but when you start looking at lenses, you're gonna start seeing quite a range when it comes to pricing even with the same focal length. So looking at something like a Canon 50 millimeter, you'll see an F1.8 for around 125, an F1.4 for around 350 bucks, and an F1.2 for 1350 bucks. You'll also see the Canon 24 to 70 F.4 that costs around 900 bucks, and another 24 to 70 F2.8 that costs around $1,700. Now that's a super significant price difference. In addition to build and quality related factors, you'll notice that the lower F value lenses are more expensive than their higher F value counterparts. Lower F values open up more, allow more light in, and let us shoot in low light situations. They also create a shallower depth of field which separates the subject from the background. And that gives us that blurry background effect. Now more expensive zoom lenses like the 24-70 F2.8 can open up to f2.8 throughout the entire focal range from 24 to 70. Inexpensive kit lenses, on the other hand, often have a maximum aperture range rather than a constant value. This means that an 18 to 55 f3.5 to 5.6 can open to f3.5 if you're shooting at 18 millimeters. But when you zoom into 55, can only open up to f5.6, and that's a huge difference. It lets a lot less light get to the sensor and also has a deeper depth of field, so the background is not as blurry. Now that we understand the basics, let's talk about which lens you should buy first. And this is where I think my opinion is different than many others. A lot of people are gonna tell you that you should go out and spend money on a Nifty 50 or some other prime. And most of the time, the reasons are that they are sharper, they open up wider, so they allow shooting in low light situation, and they create an awesome shallow depth of field. And I 100% agree with all of those reasons. I just don't think those things are the most important things when you're starting out. I actually recommend that you start out with an inexpensive entry-level zoom kit lens, something like an 18 to 55 millimeters or a 15 to 45 or 16 to 50. Those are excellent choices and here's why. Even before you take your first picture or shoot your first video, you already know that a prime lens could give you sharper images in video. You already know that they'll let more light in and you already know that you'll get a shallower depth of field. What you don't know is which focal lengths will work for your particular situation and your style of shooting. Here are some practical examples and I'm gonna cover both photography and video. Some photographers like to do portrait sessions with a 50 millimeter. Some like to use an 85, some like to shoot a 24 to 70, and some even use a 70 to 200 because they love the lens compression that they get. Which do you like? How far away from the subject do you like to be? 
and how do different focal lengths impact the way a photo looks? If you haven't tried, you don't know for yourself. If I'm doing portraits, I like to start out being closer to my subject. That lets me very quickly break the ice, interact with them, and start getting very candid and natural reactions. If I start out with an 85 millimeter or a 70 to 200, I'm gonna be really far away and that's not gonna lend itself to the type of connection that I wanna create. If you're getting into landscape or architecture photography, you might already know that you need a wide angle lens, but how wide? Let's pretend you're lucky enough to get one of my favorite cameras of all time, the Fuji X-T3, and you're gonna get a wide angle prime lens. Should you get a 35 millimeter, a 24, a 16 millimeter? You're not gonna know until you see what those focal lengths look like. So if you bought the 35 millimeter and you realize that that's not wide enough for you, you just wasted money. If you bought the 16 millimeter and you realize that that's too wide, once again, you wasted money. Instead, you can get the kit lens with a range of 18 to 55, get a lot more versatility, and then after you learn how to use your camera and your lens at various focal lengths, then you can make an educated choice about which lens you wanna buy next. You'll now be making an informed investment rather than buying a single prime lens that, while giving you slightly sharper images and opening up to a wider aperture, only offers a single focal length and it's super limiting in terms of versatility. Let's move on to video and say that you wanna shoot video for YouTube or shoot interviews for clients. You want that shallow depth of field so you start out with a 51.8, which is a great lens. When you get the lens, you realize that because you're using a camera with an APS-C sensor, your 50 millimeter is actually a 75 millimeter equivalent. You don't actually have enough room to move the camera back far enough to get the framing that you want. So even though you might be able to open it to f1.8, your subject has to be so close to the background in order for you to get more than just their head that you're actually not getting that great a separation from the background. Or maybe you bought a lens that was too wide and you need to have it so close to the subject that it creates a very unflattering look. But now you're boxed in because of the fixed focal length. I just wanted to give you a few real life situations so that you understand what is behind my recommendation. As I mentioned before, I created a much more in-depth free lens selection guide and I'll link to it in the description. And if you don't see it there, I might be working on an update. So if you have any questions, just drop me a comment. The guide will give you a lot more options at different price points for different brands and sensor sizes. I also included third party options, which can save you a ton of money and provide better price to performance ratio. In the past, this wasn't really something that I considered, but over the past few years, companies like Sigma, Tamron, and Tokina, just to name a few, have come up with some amazing lenses at great prices. Okay, now I wanna know what you think. Did this discussion make sense? Was it useful? And are there other aspects that you want me to cover or any more specific questions that I didn't answer? I really hope this video about selecting your first lens was helpful. And if it was, please let me know by leaving a comment, giving it a thumbs up, and if you haven't yet, join the community by hitting the subscribe and notification buttons. For more tips, tutorials, and reviews, you can always find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Tech Gear Talk. And you know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon. A lot of times people ask something like, I wanna shoot weddings and this is And what I need to know in order to really help is, is this your body? And a prime lens is a fixed, something like this means that when we take a 50 millimeter, this means that when, this means that when we take a 50 millimeter, you're gonna start seeing quite a range when it comes to, whereas a longer focal, where, <laughs> ah.